Hi, um, so I'm Akriti Bakshi and I'm a fashion design student at High School of Fashion Industries. Um, and today we are here with the famed designers behind Duffy Brown, um, Stephen Cox and Daniel Silver, and my fellow HSFI students, Gaiella Gerville and Avani Bowden. Um, and so I guess I would like to ask you a few questions. Um, the first one that I had was, um, since what you guys do is mostly about like challenging the norm and doing stuff that's like out of the ordinary or different, um, where do you guys like get the confidence, I guess, to go with your initial thought? Because it might not be always like, people may not be confident enough to go with it or invest in like your look. So where do you get the confidence to go with it? Sure, uh, I don't know, 35 years of therapy. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> uh, I'll start and Stephen will interrupt me and I'm sure we'll argue along the way and it's all good. Uh, you know, it's uh, we didn't start Ducky Brown when we were your age. Uh, when we started Ducky Brown in 2001, just after 9-11, I was already in my no. early 40s and Stephen was in his mid 30s. And so, is that true, Ducky? Yeah, yeah. So we already had been working. We had been working for 20 years or so, you know, out there in the world, and we knew a lot of people. And uh, we already had a good sense of ourselves. Um, and I, I think the thing is, is that, you know, it's great to work for other people and whatever you do. I mean, Stephen's career is always in fashion. Mine wasn't, though I had been in fashion at some point. But you start to learn what it is, who you are, you know, like, and it's hard to know who you are at 20 or 25 or 35 or 45 or 50. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing journey and process. But I think with therapy and given our natures, we knew that we wanted to do our own thing at some point. We're not very good at listening to other people. And uh, we love what we do. And we believe that if it really comes from somewhere deep inside of you and you're following your the voice inside you and the magic inside you, then it's going to be good for some. We never thought that we would be good for everyone. Some people love us, some people don't. It's all good. Like, yeah, I think that is the big... Uh, for me, the, it's about age. I've become wiser. I wasn't wise when I was 15, 25, 35. I'm 52 now, and I have definitely... Like the thought of doing this with you when I was 25 was very difficult for me. I couldn't talk to people. I didn't like to talk to people. Uh, I, I just was very uncomfortable. And I just, I think that you learn the older you get or and how much, just, I don't know. I mean, I, when I first started, it was always about what other people thought, what do they think of me? I mean, I think that came from me being a student. I mean, I, I, I think it goes back to being at school and being a, 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 gay, a gay boy that didn't know he was a gay boy at a school and being picked on and bullied for being feminine or you know you're like a woman you're like uh are you a poof or gay or whatever those were and i didn't really um i never I, I i never really kind of went into my shell with this i came out of my shell it was like that you know i still think about that and i think it's always that is always in my work and particularly at this time at 52 years old in this pandemic that we are in at the moment that is very very difficult for everyone i am doing this work that is is quite interesting i've never done anything like it before because there's no restrictions it may not be sold it may not be made it may not be produced we don't know whether the factories are even going to be open we don't know how long this is in this we are in this so it doesn't really it does not matter I can just do, I'm doing shapes that are on the body that don't really fit or aren't clothing or are just oblongs or squares or shapes or whatever it is. So it's really, it's all, you know, I, I, this time is very, very difficult, but there's always these things in these times when you're like, it's very powerful creatively because you're so, uh, I don't know, caged in. We are caged in. We're like caged in animals. 
But I was actually reading something before I came on here that a friend of mine wrote, and you may not know, but John Galliano is an incredible designer. He does Margiela. He's been going for many, many years. He's from the 80s, and I worked with him many years ago. And his best collect, it was about this collection he did in 1987, and he had no money. And it was the best collection he's ever done. Because so, you are restricted to do something very, almost, like, it's beautiful. Sometimes when there are like very serious restrictions, beautiful things come out of that because you don't have all the choice. You don't have everything at your disposal. So it's really time for you to be creative. You know, a question that we often used to get, you know, for 15 years we did fashion shows twice a year at New York Fashion Week. And the question that we would always, yeah. pardon? No, I've got to keep going. And the question we used to get all the time was, what's your inspiration? Well, it sort of dovetails to what you were asking about how do you feel okay enough to just pursue what it is you want to pursue. Our inspiration is us. You know, we didn't watch, uh, you know, some movie or read some book or go to some art gallery and go, we're going to do paintings based on Picasso's Guernica or we're going to do something based on, um, you know, uh, Blade Runner. Like... It, it all goes into the sieve. I mean, there are always certain constants that are throughout Ducky Brown, certain tropes. But basically, we, the inspiration is us, and the conversation is about us. And our conversation, as you said, is about wanting to challenge norms. What's appropriate? It used to be what's appropriate for men to wear. Now it's about what does anyone want to wear? And to wear and what's not okay to wear and why isn't it okay because now we've taken gender off the table in terms of ducky brown you know now we took ducky brown back two years ago into our studio which is the only place that you can find it and we sell from there and we have art shows there art exhibits but the clothing is genderless it is a sizeless and it is seasonless we do some sizes we do some pieces that are bigger than and in smaller than but no one wants to put on an extra large and, you know, people don't necessarily want to put on a, uh, an extra small. So we just, we just got rid of all of that. And so for us, the question is, is what tickles us and what do we see humans in? What do we want, you know, how do humans want to dress and what are they needing for now? And also, which is more important than ever at this moment, but also what's the craziest, What's, what are our fantasies and how do we make those come true? Because that's kind of what, you know, that is what pushes fashion forward. Fashion is an idea. It's a concept and it's trying to get people's eye to change the way they see things so that, oh, it's not, what, like, what is too narrow or too wide or too big or too small? What is fit? We all have these preconceived ideas, which we'd be better off if we threw them all out the window. It just is. And sometimes you might feel like wearing something that's really huge on the body or something that's really tight on the body or something that's really colorful or something that's sort of upside down and backwards. It's all good. And so we, when we design each collection, try to embody all of that. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Because um, I remember like even with the struggles or coming out of struggles, I remember like I think we had a chat with Michael Costello once, I think last year, and he even spoke about how for um one of his i think the runway show um he came in with like no money or anything and just kind of made something out of nothing and so that and then he ended up like winning and so um yeah for sure and so the second question i guess was when you guys were starting out since teamwork and partnership and everything is so important um where do you like how do you find your roles and how do you like deal with differences of opinions and yeah like how do you find a balance We've been together 27, 28 years, and we were together, I think, about seven or eight years before we started Ducky Brown. Because I think this next year, Ducky Brown will be 20 years old. So we kind of knew what we were in for, having been together already for seven years. Um, and the roles that we have are, you know, where we started and where we are today, it's kind of the same and kind of very different and kind of the same. So there's a lot of flexibility. Steven's the trade designer, so he is really the design force. You know, he works with the pattern makers. He works with the factories. He has that language and that ability. But as far as us coming up with ideas, we're both coming up with ideas. 
I tend to do more of the business end. I tend to do more of the PR end. I'm the one that's producing everything and making sure that we have the money and that we've got the people and hiring and doing all that. But it is, I've sat at many business meetings with Stephen who says nothing and then says one great thing that no one thought of. And, you know, vice versa in terms of design. So we try to be fluid and flexible and be respectful. Something happened in this, uh, it's always been not, it, We've been very, we, we have our separate roles, like Daniel said. Daniel is very business, and I am more the design. But I'll just say, and you know, we, I'm from England. I never wanted to go to therapy. I didn't think I had any problems or any issues. I came to New York. I met Daniel. He was in therapy. I, we go to therapy now. That helps a lot. Um, every Wednesday, we still do therapy on Zoom with our therapist. Um, something interesting did happen, though during this pandemic, which was, I always draw, and you can see them behind me, I draw, I collage, I do whatever, my sketches, and they're always mine. We can bring them closer. They're always for just to take a look. mine. Daniel never does them, Daniel has never done them. This season, not season even, whatever we are doing now at this moment, again, like I've, 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 I've told you, is, uh, the first time that I've ever done a sketch, which is definitely, Daniel started knitting these shapes for me. Daniel started knitting these scarves. When we first did Ducky Brown, I knit scarves for the collection and I ended up at Barney's and stuff. I haven't knit now for about 17 years, but during the pandemic, I'm like, I need to keep busy. I need to keep creative. I'm going to start knitting. So I was knitting some scarves yet again. So then, and then Stephen said, why don't you knit me shapes? So he's then knitting me these shapes. Now, I kind of like started them because I wanted them to maybe be like shoulder pads or something. I don't know. I don't know what they could be. But then what happened is, is that there's another one. So then what I did is I photocopied these on, or printed them out. And then these have become some of parts of the sketches on the wall. So it's the first time I've ever incorporated something that Daniel has done within my sketch, within this time that we are stuck together in our apartment for the last seven weeks, eight weeks. So I don't know, something's happened there that was a good thing. We try, you know, we really value trying to be fluid and, and not staying static and wanting to push along. And it's a journey and, you know. Here, this is one of them. See, this is a part of Daniel's that's the knit. I mean, I don't know what the hell that is or what's it going to be, but there is some kind of human form in it. Now, the problem is, what am I going to do when we have to start making the thing? So that's going to be like, what the hell am I going to do next? Anyway. We'll figure it out. I think the thing that always drives me forward and drives the company forward is, is that if you have a dream, and you want something different, you have to be willing to do different, to make it happen. Because nothing happens by magic and it's up to you. And I think that's so important for everyone to remember or to like really meditate on. If you have a dream and you want something different, you yourself have to be different. You have to do differently in order to achieve that. It's, you know, you can't keep doing the same thing hoping for a different result. That's a sign of cuckoo. You, know, you need to be able to shift. And it's really hard sometimes to do that. And it can be a lot of screaming and crying and frustration because it's really hard to give up old ways and discover new ways. But that inevitably will be your strength as designers and is one of the great strengths of Ducky Brown. Awesome, thank you. Um... I was actually even curious. I was going to ask you later on what the little things on the wall were, the sketches, I guess. Um, uh, but and then the last question that I had was um, when you guys were starting off, like what were some struggles or challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? Uh, you know, I, 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 for me, you know, the most difficult thing is jumping off into the abyss because we had written a, I had written um, a business plan. And um, so we had 
kind of asked ourselves the right questions and we got the money together. So just, you know, taking that first step is, is a big gulp and 9-11 had just happened and I think a week later I said well we're kind of ready Ducky what do you think should we like pursue this or not and Stephen looked at me and he said well this isn't exactly the right time to start a fashion company is it and my response was it's never going to be the right time so you know you just have to charge forward everything I think the most difficult thing is dealing with others that's all it is it's like there are financial issues, there are, you know, there are the things that you think are normal. But you know what? Again, during this pandemic, it's kind of incredible because we are not dealing with anyone. Nobody is telling me what to make. Nobody is telling me what to do. Nobody is telling. And when I work for people, that's what I didn't like. When we had Ducky Brown working with the buyers and the editors and et cetera, et cetera, some of them are incredible to work with. Few. There are few really good editors. There are few really good buyers. A lot are assholes and are not very nice and very difficult to work with. And that, I think, is the struggle that you have. You have to be a people person. I'm not necessarily the greatest people person. It's really easy to start your own line of clothing. You can do it with no money. You can do a t-shirt line. You can do five pieces and go, but the selling part, to sell is vicious, difficult, money, get it out, sell, sell, sell. And I was never really good at that. I think one of the big, I mean, there's like difficulties like anything, difficult to get things done, difficult to be organized, difficult to deal with all the other people coming at you. I, I think though, in like overall, the difficulty or the, the challenge, the biggest challenge, was staying true to who we were. We never wanted to be a global company. We wanted to be part of the neighborhood. We didn't want to be in a hundred stores. We didn't want to have investors and people having a piece of Ducky Brown and having certain agendas or having us do stuff we didn't want to do. We wanted we wanted to do what we wanted to do and say what we wanted to say. And we wanted to maintain that purity, which is almost impossible, especially in New York. Because New York is not so much about fashion as it is about money. It's about clothing. And that's, there's a big difference, you know, from Europe, which is really fashion, and, and New York, which has had moments of fashion. When we began, there was a moment around 2001, 2002, 2003, where there was something palpable happening in New York in terms of fashion, and it was exciting. But unfortunately, in the last, you know, from in the last 10, 15 years, that has been destroyed for many reasons that I don't need to go into, but that that has been chipped away at. So that is why we are where we are in terms of New York fashion and why there's no longer a men's week and who's really showing on the schedule and you see the people who have gone out of business. And I think this is an amazing time because it'll come back again and there'll be a moment of great creativity and fashion. But it's really hard to sort of stick to your guns and, and not get um, waylaid. I always said to people, if you want to have your own design house, you have to really love what you want to do. You have to really want it and you have to really love it. You have to love design. You don't forget about celebrity making money because that stuff comes and goes and it's, it's ephemeral. And in the end, it's meaningless. What's really meaningful is that you get to get, that we get to get up every day and do something that's challenging and meaningful and something that we love. And that's hard because there are financial constraints. So sometimes we've had to take other kinds of jobs as Ducky Brown to fund Ducky Brown or do collaborations. But we've always had to sort of balance what are we willing to do to stay in business and still keep Ducky Brown pure. And that's been a wonderful, frightening, horrible, amazing journey. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for answering my questions. And so that was for me if Avani wants to take over now all right <laughs> yeah hi um uh, <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> yeah. So my first question is, um, how are you ho hoping to further influence society? Like, what do you want people to take away when they hear the name Ducky Brown or when they see your collection? Well, uh, you know, that's interesting. I, I don't really think about those things. I want people to come in and see the collection and enjoy it. And I want people who want to, to, to buy it, to wear it. I mean, people that tend to be our customers love wearing Ducky Brown and they really appreciate it. They appreciate now more than ever that we're selling it to them, that they're coming into our studio, that there's stuff on the rack, but we're like, wait a minute, we've got something in the closet from a few seasons ago. This would be perfect for you. That they're, we're giving them an experience of buying something unique. You know, when we're making a collection, especially at this time in the last few years since it's just been ducky brown at the shop at the studio we're making two of everything or four of everything we're not making four thousand so you're really getting something special and when we see people put it on and they look great and they appreciate it and they're happy we're happy you know our i think our want is very small and very realistic um you know so people think whatever Listen, quite frankly, I've never been too concerned about what others think of me. There are people that are going to love me, and there are people that are not. There are people that are going to love Ducky Brown, and people that are not. And that's all okay. You know, let me be with the people who love me. Let me be with the people who want to be with me. And those that don't, that's great. Go find something else. I think, I, I mean, I th for me, I think I've already done what I wanted to do of having my own design you know i wanted to have my own design company and show as a, as a fashion show you know like that, that that's that's the student dream or some students dream so i did that part so that's kind of uh i've done that now i i just i think it's just keep it's for, it's very much more about me. I think I think it sounds very selfish, but I I really just do things for me. And if somebody wants to buy it, that's really good. But it's really just I just want to continue doing these very beautiful things. Some um, and 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 there's a lot of st it was funny because when you said that there's some things that I do that are so tiny that nobody ever has ever, ever seen them. Like sometimes when I'm putting a label on inside a piece of a jacket, if it's a really, really special, like organza piece or something, I will like leave the string on just stitching, when I'm stitching a ducky brown label in. So I'm just stitching a little bit of white. I will leave a, a, about two inches of the thread and I will make a tiny bow in the cotton. That's it. So on one of the corners of the rectangle label, there is a tiny little cotton bow. Nobody knows that. There are, things, there are many things like that. If I can keep doing that and then tell you that nobody else has, I've never told that to anybody. Nobody's ever noticed it either, apart from me. Um, then I've done well. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Um, well, kind of going off of the feeling of you knowing what you've want, seeming that you've known what you've wanted to do, what do you think you would be doing had you not been designers? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. It's like, you know, what would I have done if I'd been six foot two and 150 pounds and born a woman? Would I have been a supermodel? Like, I, you know, yeah. like I like that to me is like sci fi. I don't know. I, I know that we both have the ability to be somewhat flexible and to find our way. So we we would have survived. We would have created yet well, another story. You. I mean, I, I, I would, I think I immediately say, like, and I, I always have two things. It's either I, I wanted to be an architect or a dancer. That would have been for me. I did want to be an airline pilot, but I hate flying, so I don't know what that, that was when, 
It was a television cameraman and an airline pilot for many years as a child. And then now I would say architect or dancer, or I just want to be Kate Moss. That, that's like my ridiculous feed, like Linda Evangelista or Kate Moss or Christy Turnington. One of the old supermodels that would do for me if I had to change my life. I've been There's many things. Female. I've been an actor. I've been uh, uh, a display person for Barney's and Bendel's and doing the windows in the early 80s as well. I was a glove designer. I was a commercial producer. I was a TV producer, daytime talk show producer. I was a fundraiser. And then for the last 20 years, I've done Ducky Brown. So I, I have, and it's all the same in the end, trust me, because it's, it's me. And so nothing is a waste of time, which is something to really remember in life, because you're always bringing you to it and you'll always come back to it. So, I mean, here I've done Ducky Brown for 20 years, but I'm still producing, right? Producing shows, producing collections. I'm still acting and talking to people. I'm still in, like, I'm still raising money when I would raise money for Ducky Brown or find, finding other business ventures. So it's like anything you do is just, those talents just keep building on top of you as you get older and you're able to sort of have a fuller life and bring more to whatever job you do. So it's all, it's a plus plus, even when it seems like a waste of time. Yeah, I don't know whether I actually want to be anybody else. I think I've had, I, I, it, it's all good at the moment. To like me and to be me. This is, you know, this, this creation, this creation doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, I'm just so happy and pleased of the life that I'm living and that we're living. You know, we're lucky and we're fortunate and, you know, we're a little wacky around the edges and we're argumentative and we're opinionated and we're blunt and we're kind and we're loyal and we're a lot of things. Rude. <laughs> so, what else would you like to know about us? Um, what emotions do you come across when creating a collection? Everything. Um, Difficulty, that's not an emotion. Uh, well, when I was telling you that story about the bow, I thought I was gonna, I, I felt very, I, I was, it was very emotional. Like it was like very, I was, I thought I was gonna cry. It was very special. It was like, I, I, I think that there is sometimes when you're doing a, a, a collection, it, like particularly at night, when I've been doing this one, it's been very like uh, euphoric almost. It's like, you're just, um, I'm, how lucky am I that I get to do this ridiculous, these things that I, I don't know what they're gonna, where they're gonna go. I, I, I get very excited. It's like almost, um, you know, dizzy or something. I, I, I you know, I, I guess I, I experience all the emotions. Sometimes I'm very fearful about how we're gonna do that, how's that gonna be, is that gonna work? Uh, and it's a good fear, you know, it's questioning and it's aware that not everything you want to do can happen or you're not able to make happen. Um, of course, some of the best things are mistakes or things that you have no control over. And I've had a lot of great joy in doing art collections. There's been a lot of moments that have been euphoric and that have, like all of a sudden, like it's all just lined up and organized, and it just feels right. And I and I just feel lucky and so happy that I have this moment. Because you know, when everything's going really well, it means there's a bunch of other stuff that's not so good that's coming for you. And when you're in the middle of when everything's falling down, the only really good stuff when everything's falling down is that at some point it's going to stop and you're gonna build yourself up again, you know? But you, you, you gotta be in the game to win it. You can't give up, you know? Because only you can do you. And that, it, that can be really hard sometimes. Because, you know, we all grow up differently. We have different education, different cultural backgrounds, different religions, different kinds of families, different kinds of money problems, living situations. There's just a lot of, outside noise and stuff and to sort of 
deal with that stuff and then get on with your own story, that's a lot for everyone, every single person. That is a lot. Um, but I think it's possible. I think it's possible for you, for you, and for you. It's possible. And that hopefully can help you, propel you forward. Thank you. That was, that was very inspirational. Um, I believe Gaiella has some questions now. Sure. Hi. Um, so you already explained to us about what inspires you. I wanted to ask, um, when you don't feel as motivated, how do you overcome this? What did you say? Sorry. When you don't feel, when you don't, when you don't feel as motivated, how do you overcome it? Guyana? Is that your name? Gaiella. Yes. Gaiella. Uh, well, I think... You know what? You're not always going to feel inspired. And I think it's okay. You know what? It's okay not to get out of bed for a day if you don't feel like it. It's okay to cut yourself some slack. Not every day is going to be a five-star day. And I think one of the things, at least I've learned in my life, is that that's okay. It's okay not to feel like working one day or two days. It's okay to take time off. It's okay that I'm not inspired today. Maybe I'll be inspired tomorrow. I think the way that I deal with that is I try to do things that are meaningful to me, whether it's running around the park or cooking a great meal or watching an interesting film or knitting or whatever it is that tickles me. Because I think the more that I'm able to do stuff that's of interest to me, that feeds into my inspiration, my ability to sort of put it back out there. But I just think it's okay when you're not okay. Well, it was interesting because I think when we first started this lockdown situation, I noticed that everyone, including my brother and his wife and my friends, were all like frantically, like painting the apartment, painting that wall, doing this, doing the gut, like trying to do so many things of, you know, particularly in New York, there's this, all, everyone's always so bloody busy. I hate, it's like, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. No, I'm busy, oh no, I'm busier and I'm busy. I love to say I'm not busy. It's like, you know what, it kind of shocks people. It's like, oh my God, I'm so, it's like this kind of badge of honor of like, Who's the busiest? I'm busier than you, and I'm the Tars busy, and who's ever busy, busy, busy. And I have learned, when I first started this, what we are doing now, it was very kind of manic, and it's kind of similar to Daniel, of like, because we've got time now, and I don't know how long the amount of time is, it has become easier for me to not do a sketch every single, you know, I don't have to do the entire collection in a week. There is no limit. So I haven't done a sketch for a few days now. And before that would be very difficult for me. But now it's like, okay, so I'll have another few more days. I don't have to do one until tomorrow all the time. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, there will, there's, I've never run out of ideas. There's always another idea coming. For me, if it doesn't come in that day, it definitely comes in the middle of the next day or the middle. It, it's never, I've never run out. I've never gone dry. There's always been something. There's always, I've seen something, a tennis ball over there and I've photocopied a tennis ball and it's gone into another something else. So I just, I don't know. It's just, it's, I think you can give yourself time. And cut yourself slack. Yes. I mean, I think for us, Take that. the reason so why sorry. there's always another story is because we're always constantly talking about the collection or what are we doing or what's important to us. And, and, that, and the conversation is, is ongoing because it's coming from inside of us. You know, like we once met a designer that we were friends with and he said to me, what are you going to do next season? I've run out of ideas. And I looked and I was like, you've run out of ideas. Like, well, where are, you, where are your ideas coming from? He's like, oh, I don't know, a magazine, a movie. I'm like, well, if you keep looking outside of yourself, of course you're gonna get bored or you're gonna run out of ideas. But if you've got a rich inner life, how could you ever 
run out of ideas. It's like, how can you ever stop loving someone? Like, like how can you stop breathing? I, I just think that if you're in it and you're constantly having that conversation and engaged, there's always more until you're dead. And not every idea is good. No. It's like, I've done some things and it's like, oh my God, that's awful. But then you learn But it that. has led to something really interesting. You know, I think, am I good enough? Has always been a really, 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 really difficult question for me. Am I good enough? Am I a good enough designer? And what, what do I need to do to prove that I'm good? And you know what? That takes, again, time and age of like, I don't think I'm very good. I'm not good. I'm, you know, and who is good? And what is good? Is it because you've got like a, a win an award or you've got this, that, you know, not all designers that are famous are good. In fact, a lot of designers that are famous are not good. Do you know no. what I mean? It's just, it's, it's like, it's, <laughs> not, it's not the most talented that win an Academy Award necessarily. Yeah. You know, awards are given out, awards do more and are given out for our, our award ceremonies are for the people that are creating that ceremony, not necessarily for the winners. And it's not always the best who succeed. There's much more to like financial success or worldwide fame than just So I don't know, I just say feed yourself. And be good to yourself. And, when are you going and learn back? to love yourself. Do you know if you're going back? When do you go back? You don't know. September. And is September. That, that's what they said. Is that certain or it's not certain yet? I have what, no idea. What does that look like? We don't what, know. What, really, yeah, we don't know yet. Okay, one thing at a time. They said September, so. <laughs> hard for you all because you're younger than we are and yeah. uh, you're anxious and there's yeah. a lot of things you want to do and friends you want to be with and there's a lot of no coming. Uh, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't. And you're young and I'm sure you feel somewhat invincible and you're scared and you don't know how it's going to end and when is this going to end and what is this going to look like. And the amazing thing about this moment is that that's a world, those are worldwide questions. Everyone is feeling that. And no one is feeling that. It is an amazing story, though, that we can all in this Zoom room tell for many years for the rest of our lives. Whether you have children or whether you have relatives that you can talk, we all are in this together around the world. And it will come to an end, I don't know when, but we will be able to tell an amazing, it's an amazing story that you were part of this, kind of like 9-11, I suppose, and that kind of thing, even though it was. Anyway, sorry, I'm sidetracking. What, ask me another question. Um, okay, um, speaking about collections, what have been your favorite piece that you've designed and why? Our favorite piece, that's ours, um, your, your. Mine. Yes, I understand. She was asking our. I know that means we're two separate people. I you know. have your Just choice. I have my choice. <laughs> um, okay. That's how we manage. You can say we. Uh, well, the first thing I thought of uh, was not so much our favorite, my favorite piece but a piece that was shot, so it became my favorite image. And that was, um, we call it the elephant boy, but it was this long sweater that Stephen did that had arms all the way basically to the ground and went to like mid calf. And it was done in this silky yarn. And it was like this beautiful sweater. And we have this image of this young boy that we did this shoot with modeling it like this. And it just looks amazing. And I'm just like, wow, it's such a simple piece. And it looks so incredible that I was really blown away that we were part of making that image. Like, I, I was just like, wow. 
I think that there was, uh, I think it changes for me because it's like, and I do that thing what, 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 when you ask the question, what was the first thing that comes to my mind and that will be where I will at this moment and it does change over the years. But what came to me was, is that when I was, uh, I don't know, at college, I did a sketch of a uh, pair of wife front underwear, men's, like the Calvin Klein wife fronts, but they had gloves. There was gloves inside of them, so there was two slits in the pocket, and then you put your hands inside pants, as we call them in England, underpants, and the gloves were on the inside. I never made them at college. I never made them when I was working for everybody else. I never made them. And then at 34, when we first started Ducky Brown, so I don't know, at 14, 15, 16, 17 years later, the first piece that I asked Darren, I think our pattern maker, to do was, but the first piece of Ducky Brown, which was only 17 pieces in our first collection in 2001, was these underwear with gloves. And we did them every season. And they were kind of like, you know, like guys put their hands in their pockets all the time. Like you just put your hands in your pockets in a pair of khakis or whatever it is. But this was the idea of putting your hands in your underwear. Now we did them in white, we did them in crazy colors. But I, I also had only found out I don't know, a few years before that, that Daniela had actually had a career of being a glove designer as well. So he knew people that could make gloves. Anyway, it was, it's a very obscure piece. It's a very beautiful piece. Um, but it's just, it is a pair of men's wide front underwear with gloves in, hanging inside them that you put your hands through slits. I think if you look on our Instagram, there might be a picture of Stephen. We had a photo of Stephen in them, and I think it appeared in French Vogue. It was in French Vogue. And I think great. that image might be on our Instagram way down somewhere. You might find That was it. great. That was a good moment. But, you know, whatever our favorite I piece was of, that we've ever done, like anything else, it changes, as Stephen said. I think also we do... Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I'll, and then I'll go to our most classic piece, which is, you know, a tailored black crombie coat, which is like so beautiful and so tailored. And unfortunately, the factory that we have it made in does not exist anymore, which is a, another story, but just a black wool men's crombie. I mean, those two pieces kind of are form the foundation of Ducky Brown where it's this incredibly classic 18th century men's piece of like incredible tailoring and then these whacked out gloves with underwear well worn together on some beautiful male, female, whatever it shot. That, that, that's what we do. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask, have you ever worked with any celebrities? What was your experience and who was your favorite to work with? Uh, we have worked with some celebrities. You know, that can be um, an interesting, prickly situation because you're dealing with people. You know, my theory about all that stuff is that when you're dealing with someone who's been very rich and very famous for a long time, it really changes people's DNA. You know, they're not living in any kind of world that we know as, as, a, as normal. You know, it's like... Um, like Usher once came to us and came to the studio and he was very nice, very quiet. He tried on a bunch of stuff. And at one point I looked at the, at the end of the studio and there was this huge man at the doorway. And I, like, I'm thinking to myself, who's that? And then I'm like, oh, that's like the bodyguard, I guess. So I looked at this guy, I'm like, hey. And he's like, hey, I'm like, do you want a glass of water? Do you need to use the bathroom? Like, like, I'm just acknowledging him. And I thought to myself, well, that's so strange, because, you know, Usher kind of looks like Usher, but, you know, there's lots of celebrities in New York that walk the streets and you'd never recognize them. And I think Usher could walk around and no one would know it was Usher. But that's, I think, for Usher, part of how he rolls, you know? He's got the bodyguard, he's got the escalade, and that's his thing, and that's fine, too. As celebrities are, we it's very difficult though because we want to try and work when we have worked with the celebrities. You know, you get their press assistant asking, 
Um, you know, it, and, and not every celebrity, but the press assistant will ask. And then the, we want to meet the celebrity. We want to meet our clients. And it always kind of, if you, like we had a, an email, I think, last year about Kim Kardashian. Oh, no. To buy Jackie Brown. Four years ago. Four years about Kim Kardashian. But we want to meet Kim Kardashian. We want her to come to the studio. We don't want any. Cameras. She actually didn't want to meet. And she didn't want to buy. She didn't want to buy. She, want, she, she wanted to borrow. And I said, actually, we don't give out to celebrities because uh, we don't dress celebrities for free because, you know, we only make so many. And of course, it's going to come back trash. If someone's wearing it for eight hours. That's even if it comes back. You know how that can be. So I said, I'm sorry, we don't give out to celebrities, but if Miss Kardashian would like to come by the studio, we'd be happy to sell her anything that she wants at full price. When we first opened Ducky Brown... I never heard from them again. When we first opened Ducky Brown in about 2003, Britney, or there was a Britney Spears and a Madonna did a duet together. Now, this is Britney Spears and Madonna, which in our time were huge. They wanted to borrow some clothes for a video. Now, I was naive and younger. Daniel wasn't. I was younger. against it. And so I've done I, production. But I didn't, I, that was when I didn't, hadn't worked with celebrities before. And having Madonna and Britney Spears in my clothing is like, wow, I need them. We've got to do this. So they wanted to borrow stuff. They took this incredibly beautiful jacket of like this crazy tweed that we had done. When it came back, it was ruined. Like the entire arm had been slashed all the way through. It, you couldn't repair it. It did nothing for us to give it to them. It is in the video and it's like kind of like one second of dancing and it's like that. The arm comes through. So it didn't say Ducky Brown. We didn't get Madonna or Britney Spears as our client. They didn't spend any money. When we asked for, could we repair? Can we have like, I don't know, a hundred bucks to repair the jacket. They said, we don't have a budget. That's now, a, this is a Madonna and Britney Spears video. It's okay, I got off like phone. millions of dollars. I got off phone to the producer. I'm like, now look, it's Madonna and it's Britney Spears. Those women have money. This is going to cost $150 and you need to send me a check. And they did. So they did us a solid. Uh, I mean, there's been a bunch of celebrities. I... For me, I feel uncomfortable naming them. It's never something I've ever dined out on. I don't want people to buy Ducky Brown just because they see someone famous in it. That seems really silly to me. But we've had some lovely kind of shallow. We've had some lovely customers that are not huge celebrities, but are like lesser celebrities, as you would say, and they have been incredible to work with. And they have been. Remember the guy from that series that came over and he came to the party. Just a really lovely guy. Oh, yeah, the guy from Empire. He was the guy lovely. from Empire. And it just, you know, it just, we don't want any kind of attitude in the studio, which sometimes that, not every celebrity, but it can get prickly quickly. And yes. I, we just, you know, I think the thing, I think I had this fantasy when we first started Ducky Brown almost 20 years ago, that if only this would happen, then we'd be on our way. Or if only we got that store, only we win that award, or if only we could, if only, if only. And what I realized is there's no if only. It's a series of events that happen that build on top of one another. And that makes a life, a career, a company. And that's the most you can hope for. You know, it's, there's never going to be the one thing that takes you over the rainbow. Life doesn't work that way. It is really the journey. It's not getting the thing. It's how you get there. And it's, I know that can be sound trite or you've heard it before, but it's life or a career or our company. It's a series of great things and not so great things that have happened over a 20 year span that got us here today talking with you and so i assume wow how lucky are we we did something really good and something right because there are still young people that want to come and talk to us and are inspired by us and want to know how we did what we did i'd rather talk to you than actually have a, a stupid celebrity 
in the studio trying to take clothes off us for free. I mean, when which we, is not everyone. When we do this at the at the high school, I always start off with, I know everything about me, so you need to be asking me questions, and I want to know what you want to know, and where you're going, and what you're doing. And what ends up is I end up writing on a blackboard all these places that you all haven't heard of, or designers you don't know about, or stores or museums in the city, and I make a whole list for people. I'm like, it's New York, go! What is interesting, though, is that I found that it's always about three normally women, young women like you, that out of a class of 25 only ask us questions. So it's interesting that this format has actually singled out those three women that yes. ask us the questions. So we're not dealing with, I love the others behind, but it's always these three beautiful, intelligent women that seem to ask us the questions over and over again. Not the same, but very interesting questions like you three, and everyone else is either on their iPhones or completely ignoring us. So I've really enjoyed this because it's been so much more focused. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I have one last question is, what's your advice for the fashion, um, for the future fashion of fashion? What's my advice? Oh, I do. Yes. That want to be designers or that want to work in the industry, or how do we see fashion globally? Like, globally, globally, <clears throat> yeah. I don't I, personally, I don't have an answer for that. No, um, can you sorry, can uh, both students and globally? It, it's both. Well, I know where fashion's going because look, look at what's happening. Barney's went out of business. The gap Neiman Marcus, Neiman Marcus is having difficulty. Um, uh, the Gap went out of business. John Barbados went out of business. There is a shift yet again, and there will be another one. So the way that clothing gets made, the way that clothing gets distributed and sold, and where it gets sold, that's really up for grabs right now. And um, I don't know how that's going to affect how people design. I can tell you how it's affecting us. And, you know, for us, we're we're making it even more personal. I mean, once we're able to manufacture in some way or another, even if we can't really leave this space or our studio, we're going to do both. We're going to create one-off pieces that are of interest to people and pieces that people want during this special time. I mean, we had our first, one of our first uh, uh, face, FaceTime calls the other day in the studio with someone yes, today. Yes, with someone who DM'd me on Instagram and he loves the collection. And there were some pieces he saw on our Instagram. I don't know if you know our Instagram official, Ducky Brown, but you can see what we do there or go on our website. And he had seen some pieces. So we on, on FaceTime, we took him through the collection and he's going to come over next week and he'll be in the bathroom or walk around. We'll be in the kitchen. We'll wear masks. We'll all socially distance. But he can try on whatever he wants. So I think, you know, for us globally, I don't know where it's going. I know there's a shift and it's changing. I That's think it's sure. going to be less global. I think it's going to be very, very special and very, very specific. And we are going to have to do what I'm doing now to sell the shirt that I've got on my back. Like, do you want this? Here it is. Well, I'll ship it to you. I think it's very, 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 very interesting for you as young women that you what, what you have to do to try and sell this and try and do it. I think it's about doing something. People want, I want you in it to show me how to wear it like they want me in it. Like I, I know that through Instagram, and this is something that, uh, again, I wouldn't admit, people really want to see me in the stuff. The, 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 the likes go up if I got it on. And listen, I am 52 years old and I am not a thin model. Beautiful, but not a thin model. And it's interesting how that's what you've got to do. You're three beautiful young women. You can sell your own clothes. I think it's in these times in the past really amazing things have come out of such horrible things like the renaissance or whatever it may be so you've got to really it's exciting it is terrible and it's fearful and it's dreadful and it's just a, a diabolical moment 
But I think also something fascinating is coming out of this that's going to take away. And it's bad that these companies, but it's sometimes good that the bigger, huge companies are going away. And this will mean that smaller, more interesting companies will develop from it. And uh, I, I just think it's exciting. We have a collection great. that's hanging in the studio that very few people have seen because it was ready and we were supposed to have a, an opening event along with an art show because we now we do art shows to bring people into the studio. March <coughs> 8th, well, we canceled that. So almost no one has actually seen in real life the collection. And I said to Stephen, I'm like, you know, I think now is not the moment because people are still freaked out. I mean, we're all freaked out still because it's like, okay, what's the next moment? Okay, we're opening up. What does that mean? Like, I think maybe after the summer, whatever happens, we will be a little more used to the new normal or our expectations will be a little different. And maybe we can be a little calmer. I still think we're all really anxious. And I said, you know, maybe in September we can start taking that collection and we can have you put on a piece and videotape it and like tape it on the foot, like shoot it on the phone in 10 or 15 second installments and talk about that one piece and have you model it and throw it up on Instagram and say, this piece available now, a little bit, you know, we have two pieces, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. Here's the price point. You DM us if you're interested. And we can sort of, create that intimate sort of connection with people through Instagram. And I think that's a value and people want that contact, especially now more than ever. And maybe that's a way that we can sell. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but you know, we're thinking about I think how can we shift this around I think and you do it still somewhere. reach out. Like you go available in 15 seconds, you put it up, 15, 14, <laughs> then it's, you take it away, it's not available anymore. Next, it's kind of like, how do you make QVC or home, home shop, shopping network, like for us? Like, you know, you, I, well, I kind of am interested in watching QVC and that home shopping network, but they don't sell, you know, they're not selling the most beautiful, expensive, beautiful clothing. How do you do, or, or, or how do you make QVC, how do you make cheap, beautiful clothing? That, that would be, anyway, I'm going on to another thing, but that, it's, it's selling stuff on QVC on, on television. How do I sell it to you over here now? You can no longer make, in my opinion, cheap, beautiful clothing. I mean, cheap is such a weird word. Inexpensive, beautiful clothing. Because that means there's someone in yes. Africa or India getting paid five cents an no, hour. That's true to make that. And we all kind of really need to think about where we're shopping. Like, it's not okay to shop at H&M or Primark or, you know, or um, not The Gap, what's the other one that's even cheaper? Whatever. Forever 21. Whatever, it's like if you're shopping at those places, basically you're enslaving children and, we young, saw a and movie. women. We saw a movie a few days ago and it's terrible. And you know, those women are getting paid four, four dollars an hour or something. But we are moving on to another thing. Yes, but it's like, I, I, I don't think there's anything as inexpensive, beautiful clothing necessarily. I think you've got to pay for it on some level. You can't, if you're buying a five dollar t-shirt, someone's <clears throat> suffering because of it. And it's something to think about. And I think the minute that you do that, it, we're contributing to the whole world global shit show. And I think we need to be more responsible. I've been that. looking, because I've got more time online, at like designers around the world that you've never ever heard of. And I've found some really interesting ones. If you look and you go onto like obscure websites in like the Netherlands, there's some really, really interesting young male and female designers that are out there, more or beyond male and female, that are doing some really interesting things that are not cheap, but they're not like Gucci or Balenciaga prices. Well, those are inflated prices. But, you know, I mean, there's, there's a difference between buying a T-shirt for $5 or buying a T-shirt that's $50. Anyway. I mean, you want to buy things from people that are practicing fair trade 
I think some it's level. an interesting thing. You know, responsible trade. And, you know, like all our stuff gets manufactured in the New York area. So we've never dealt with sweatshops. We've never done anything overseas. Like, it's not... Because we always wanted to be small and special and have control and deal with whatever problems. So it meant that we, we couldn't produce anything in India. Like, it just wasn't happening for us to, like, do T-shirts or whatever. We did embroidery. We did embroidery. We paid. But we paid, and we checked out those factories, and we had those relationships. Anyway, it's something else. But I, I think it's an exciting moment because we don't know what's next in terms of fashion and how it will look and how it will be. And it's really your generation that's going to tell us. And it that's, seems like that's the thing, exciting. The things that are set, the, the masks are selling at the moment, they're, you can't get them. They're like selling out. So, I mean, if you want to make some money, I'd make some scarves and masks. It seems like that's... Or a garment that's attached to a mask, or a hat that comes down into a mask that you can pop up and down. I mean, there's lots of ways of slicing it, you know? Who knows? A mask that turns into an armband. I mean, I don't know. You know I always say throw it all out there and then see what sticks. But that's just the way we work, you know? When do you graduate? Sorry, say it again. You graduate. When do we graduate? Next year? 2021, yeah. Is there, are there any other questions that you all have? No, that's all. Uh, Kriti, Avani? Um, actually, so if, if, like, what I guess, what would we do if we were in that, like, so, okay, so for example, like, for me, I do like the, I want to find companies that are, like, sustainable or that are, um, treating their factories well or like you know they're good brands but there aren't a lot that are like in a good price range I guess or a budget so like for those who have a budget I guess it's not like the higher level like what would you do then? Well you need to figure out the companies that you know I always say when people are looking for jobs I always tell kids make a list of the top 10 places you want to work go down that list and reach out to all of them and when they all say no go to the next 10 and then go to the next 10. If you're looking for a job, you won't be so lucky never to find one. If you keep looking, you know what I mean? You, something will happen if you keep trying. If you stop trying, nothing will happen. And so you wanna research those companies to make sure you feel okay about, okay about what it is they do and how they perform. So you're gonna, you know, you're probably gonna to wanna to find smaller companies like, you know, I don't know who's making CK by Calvin Klein, but, um, you know, you might want to find smaller New York-based or West Coast-based companies that seem to have more of a, a considered situation and are more conscious of what they're doing. Or maybe you don't want to stay in New York. You might be, I, I mean, I think that what's happening, I'm seeing friends are moving away from New York. I think people don't want to be in New York. Uh, four of our friends are moving in the middle of this. One is moving to Kentucky. The other is moving to, over to, to, to California. So I think that there's going to be, maybe in the future, companies that aren't based in New York that are more interesting or uh, you just have to, I, I think it's about, you know, I mean, when I was at college, I, you know, wanted to work for a big, you know, a high-end designer and I sent so many resumes out and didn't get anything back. I didn't get anywhere. It was just, you know, it's difficult because you have to kind of know somebody. But it is about trying to find somebody that you really like first. You love their designs. Whoever you like, I don't know who it is, but you know, if you want to go and work for, if you want to go and work for Marnie or Prada or whatever, I mean, obviously, it's not going to happen at the moment. And I don't know how you, you know, listen, many companies aren't going to survive this. You know, J. Crew is finished. John Barbados is finished. Barney's is finished. Like, there is going to be less people. But, you know, maybe that's a good, others will come up. I but others know. will come up. And I, I just think, you know, you want to try to do, you want to try to find a fit that's right enough for you. You're not going to get it all. 
you know, but you, you want to find an inn where you feel comfortable enough with the with the philosophy of the company. Who do and, you like? And I really believe that's possible. Who, like, if you had to say who, like, who, who would you love to work for? If you could work right for, now, right? Any Top three in companies the in the world. I mean, right now, at least like on Instagram, I've been seeing a lot of like Christian Sirianos, like masks and the looks and things. But yeah, so definitely like him would be a top. Well, you know, he's in New York and I'm telling you, you know, the thing about trying to get your foot in the door is you just have to really, you have to be smart, eager. You need to be a bother without being too much of a nudge, if you know what a nudge is. You need to be persistent in a polite way and you need to be willing to do anything. He's going to like you. He's going to love you. It's like, okay, let me just, let me clean your studio for the next month. <laughs> okay. And just do that. Okay. And you don't have to pay me for one month. And at the end of that, like, then we can talk. Like you need, you know, it's, I, sometimes your dream job though, isn't your dream job either. Exactly. You know what? It's sort of like this. Let's say you've got, you know, for, I'll just talk about my own self. Oh my God, there's this guy I met and he's so dreamy and Not oh my me. God. And I wish, I just wish he would look at me. And you know, the guy oh, ends yeah. up talking to you and you're like, oh my God, he's such a jerk. And then some other guy comes along from left field that you didn't even expect and you end up going out with him. So my thing is, is, is you never know when it's gonna be the one or one of the ones. And, but I do know this, the job you didn't get only means that you dodged a bullet. Yeah. And there's something better going to happen if you keep trying. And it's okay to get fired. Yes. Because I've got fired from every job I've ever had. Not every. And it's all good. Don't exaggerate. No, but, I almost did. But life is, you know, filled, life is filled with great joys and great disappointments. And at the end of the day, they don't mean anything. What really is important is keep going. And that's really hard to do. This has been like a therapy but session. But you can do it and just get all the help you need. It takes a village. It takes, you know, get the help. I don't know if you have to go to the gym, if you have to go to therapy, if you have to bake with your mother Good luck. or like rake with your father or uh, wh whatever it is, you have to babysit. You have to like bus table. Like, I don't know. It's hard for all of us. But I'm telling you, if you remain focused and you're willing to move and not be stuck and do things differently, find the way. It's like water. It gets there no matter what. You know, water is an amazing force. It gets there. It breaks through rock. You can be water. Well, thank you. That's awesome. Very inspirational. <laughs> For sure. Um, I also liked how you guys like touched on the um, not beating yourself up over like not having a productive day because like that's a like a huge thing. I feel like I was talking about this like with another group as well, where I was just like this. I, I like, started off the quarantine as well, where I was like super focused and like everything was like you know like super productive. But then I had like a whole week where I was just like in bed all the time. So I feel like it's very like I guess relatable to think like okay, no, it's fine. Like, step back and be okay with it. Perfect. None of us know how to do this. And you know, it's not a sprint. This is like way more than you can see. So it's really the best advice I give myself is it's today. What am I doing today? The only thing I think about tomorrow is what am I making tomorrow night for dinner? Because I might need to take something out of the freezer. So that's the only thing I do in the future. Otherwise it's what's happening today and if you do each day like that the future can take care of itself but more than that we don't know so why bother if you worry about the what ifs and ands and maybes you're going to go crazy deal with the what now not the what ifs it makes it easier did you make the top that you have on uh no but i think i like thrifted it a while ago <laughs> or actually i might have gotten it from our school store actually but um yeah no i haven't thrifted it but i have made some similar ones somewhere but yeah <laughs> yeah and i would say be try to be as creative as you can in this it's very process. interesting though because i always think that i can see where people where they should work and what they should do 
because it's fashion and it, 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 you know, like when you work at Calvin Klein, you look a certain way. And when you, when I worked at Calvin Klein, I looked a certain way. And when I did work at Ralph Lauren, I became something else because you become very Ralph. And it was interesting when I asked you that question, and, and it's you because you're up big on the screen now, and I would say it to the other two women as well. But I was actually surprised when you said Christian Siriano because I would never put you with him. Like I would put you with more of like Marnie or uh, Prada or like The Row or somebody. Um, and Do I you like know those labels? I like I like Christian Siriano, but I don't I don't I don't. I, I like the ruffles. I liked the ruffles. Like everything he does always has like a lot of fullness to it. I guess. Like yeah. Time, but you don't. You you seem a little bit more intellectually monastic or something i don't know but i wouldn't have put you with christian siriano you never I know. Don't know but think about that as well because it's not always i don't know you look like you could work at calvin klein too in that kind of like you've got this i wouldn't mind it <laughs> kind of moon moon thing on. well thank you um if anyone else had any questions left. you want to see Sketches, no, or yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see. Why don't you take the camera? I can't. I would take the camera up to you, but I just take them off the wall and bring them to you. <laughs> Why don't you just bring your top three that you like, Ducky? I'm gonna bring just one. Okay, he's bringing one because I don't want to start taking them down. There's one. So you see, I don't know what that is, but it's something and it's just a shape. So it doesn't really have to go anywhere. So we'll see. What medium is it in? It's, uh, it's just collage, it's just cut out shapes. But this is a friend, the faces, a friend of mine is stuck on an island in Greece, Mykonos, and he's doing all this Greek iconic painting. So he's done, he drew all the faces for me. He's hand painted all the faces and then he hand painted the feet. So I'm using them and the rest of it is just, it's just stuff that I printed out here. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. See, this is, this is Daniel's, this is the shape that Daniel knitted. So that was the shape. And then that was the sketch. Again, there is some kind of human shape in there. But I don't, this is a friend of mine who's in Chicago and she's like a potter. So she's making these pieces for me, kind of like jewelry out of clay. Again, it's like, it's almost like completely unwearable, but it's going to go on the body somewhere because it's like, are we ever going to produce it? I was thinking that we could take them and we could shrink them all down and then do heat presses and put them on like just a huge white shirt or a pair of shorts. But of course, he hates that idea. Mm -hmm. I can... yeah. I kind of use like a cow print also, like if you had like a bunch of them. So I, you know, I'm very practical that way. Let's just take pieces we already have and maybe we can find a heat press place that can turn that into a, you know, a decal that we can iron on. Because that's always nice too. But well, I, that we won't I think do. that's too practical for Stephen. That we won't be doing. But, you know, we'll work it out. No, I'm like much more into like doing something. That I want to do this thing that's like absolutely enormous, but just like a kind of shape. And then you put some, it's, I don't know. You know what? I don't know. I, how, I, we, we've got, we can't do it at the moment because it's impossible. But we are going to give all those sketches to Vogue.com as our next collection for September. And it'll be interesting to see whether they run those sketches because we don't have a show. We can't have a model here, you know, like then there's the photographer and there's that and social distancing. So we want to just give our sketches and it'll be interesting to see whether they accept that or not. Here's one of you Daniel's know, How shapes. flexible they are. This is like a little fish shape. 
So I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, what what's going to happen for New York Fashion Week? What are people going to show? I don't know. All right. It's okay not to know. And I think that's really hard for all of us because there is a tendency culturally to want to put people in a box to label them. Are you straight? Are you gay? Are you black? Are you white? Are you a men's wear designer, a women's wear designer? Do you design tops, bottoms, dresses, fancy day wear, night wear? Like, you know, there's all these categories that just drive you crazy. And it's like, it's okay not to know, and it's okay not to fit in a box, and it's okay not to define yourself with all those labels. So, that's what I think. You know, this has been an amazing opportunity. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> I just wanted to pop in. Um, you know, first and foremost, thank you so much for taking time to meet with all of us. You've shared so much insight about your experience, your history with the brand, you know, a lot of your core values and beliefs that have, you know, shaped you as designers and as the brand. And it's really inspiring for our students. And, you know, you sharing that knowledge and, you know, paying it forward to them, like, you know, they're, they're going to remember this. And this is what's going to follow them into their careers. And I'm sorry you came and broke it up on my end. I said it's inspiring to talk to them as well. The other way. I yeah, mean, it's a two way. <laughs> but we, amazing. <laughs> Wonderful job. <laughs> okay. All right. Sure. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for today. Does anybody else want to say um, anything before we all kind of part? Thank you. I really appreciate the time that you guys said. And we're happy to talk with you. You can always reach us on our Instagram or me at, uh, online. Official Ducky Brown. Official Ducky Brown or Daniel at DuckyBrown.com. You can always get me email. And if we ever get back to the studio and things are a bit different, then Mommy, Daddy. Come, and come to the studio and see what we're doing and come to the next art show and hang. Bye. All right. Thank you. Have Thank you so much, you. Daniel. Thank you so Thank much, Dave. Longtime so friends for, of fashion. We loved everything that you said, and the students are definitely going to learn and grow from every your insightful message. Thank you so much, guys. From the bottom of our hearts, um, our students are going to hold your words dearly. Thank you. Take care. Cut yourself some Bye, guys. That's right. <laughs>